Well, welcome to the Josh Hall Web Design Show. Web Design Show, helping you build better websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hello, everybody. Welcome into episode 106, where you're going to be hearing from a very close colleague of mine. This is Christian Vantoff, who, apart from having an awesome last name that sounds like a Bond villain, he is a white label web designer. And for those of you who are maybe new to web design and you're not sure what that term means, that means that as a white label designer, you are doing design and development for websites, but other agencies are doing the selling and project management and working with the client. So there's a lot of reasons why you might want to become a white label web designer. And in this episode, my man Christian shares exactly how he did it because he was doing web design kind of part time and was able to take it full time, quit his corporate job and go full time white label web design. And what's really interesting about Christian and his story and his path right now is that he lives in Brazil and a lot of clients around him, or should I say a lot of uh, the businesses around him were not his ideal clients. So he actually works exclusively as a white label web designer with folks from the US, from the UK, and all over. So for those of you who are in an area in the world where you feel like businesses are not ideal, your ideal clients are not right around you locally, or even if you're stateside, maybe you just live in the middle of nowhere and there's literally not many businesses in your area, white label web design is an incredible way to go. And in this episode, Christian really opens up about his entire journey and how he built his name as a white label web designer and how he started getting clients abroad and and it was really fascinating to hear his approach to this because he essentially built his name in Facebook groups and other forums. And that's how he came across my feed. And Christian is now one of our lead designers with my web design agency in transit studios. So it's, it's a really great story here. And it's going to inspire you for those of you who want to do white label web design. And we talk about this, but there's a little a secret that I'm going to let you in on. And if you want to be a white label web designer, one of the best ways to do so is to get into the Divi community. Now, there's a lot of other builders where like Elementor and Oxygen and some of these other WordPress builders where they have some communities, but there is no online community stronger than the Divi community. And this is exactly where Christian made his name and, st and started his white label career. So if that's you and you want to get into white label, I highly recommend that you also get into Divi and the Divi community. And if you don't know Divi and you don't know WordPress, yet, I want to invite you into my Divi WordPress beginners course. This is the quickest way to learn Divi, learn WordPress and get confident with building websites. And then as soon as you feel that confidence, you can then start building your white label web design career. There's a lot of different Facebook groups out there, including my Facebook group, which is the Divi web designers Facebook group. It's actually where Christian started making a name for himself, as you'll hear about. So I want to, I want to encourage you to join the course and join the community if that's you, because that's going to be the quickest way to build build a white label career. And again, if you're in a place in the world where you feel like, I don't know if I can start a web design business, there's no clients around me, white label is the way to go. And guys, I'm telling you right now, there is such a need for it. So if you want to do white label, let's do it. Listen to this episode. This is going to give you all the tools and resources and make sure you join my course to help you with Divi and WordPress. And without further ado, here's my man, Christian. He was awesome. Great, great, great opportunity to hear what's worked for him. It's what I'm going to recommend for you. Those of you who want a white label and without further ado, let's kick it. Christian, welcome on to the podcast, man. So great to have you on. And it's great to finally chat one-on-one -on -one with you. Thank you for having me. It's excited to to be here, and um, I think it was a year ago that you almost launched your um, podcast. I think a little bit over a year now, and uh, it's great to be finally be on there after we've talked so <laughs> so many times <laughs> about it. Um, so yeah. No, yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome to have you on. You have a heck of a story and a heck of a path and a journey so far, and that's what we're going to dive into because you are. You're one of the best examples I've seen of a white labeler and how to do that effectively. And I want to dive into that. But again, it's really cool to chat with you one on one, man. You, you work with, you know, you're, you're one of our lead designers within transit and, you know, you're my membership. We've been chatting, I think, 
pretty frequently here for about a year, over, maybe, yeah, over a year, because you went through my business course. And this is the first time we actually have done a one-on-one -on -one call. So I figure, hey, why not just share it with everybody and, uh, and make this a podcast episode? So yeah, why don't you let everyone know uh, to start off here, Christian, where you're based out of and what you do with your web design business? So uh, my name is Christian, uh, and I'm from the originally from the Netherlands. Um, and I live now in Brazil. Um, and when I, I got married here two and a half years ago, and that's when I completely um, migrated officially on paper as well, became a resident of Brazil. <clears throat> um, so, and the first time I went to Brazil was eight years ago, about eight, nine years. And that's where I got to know my wife uh, during a voluntary project of Youth of Mission, uh, a Christian missionary organization. And that's kind of, we, kind of how we connected and uh, from one thing led to another. So, <laughs> and we decided to get married and two and a half years ago, I completely moved here. Uh, I think I'm whole, almost here now for four years, mm, um, nice. but moved to here officially as a resident as well when we got married. And I got my complete, well, my, um, I got my visa for long term. So almost, yeah, for the whole future that's uh, ahead. So, yeah. And I have my own company, Bright Soul, which is now being registered for the second time because when I moved from the Netherlands to Brazil, it had to. Um, shut down my company in the Netherlands because I was just going to ask if you had that when you transitioned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in that way, I've created the company twice in two different countries. So that's also another story. <laughs> that's a whole other podcast time. right there, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, so that was quite a, kind of interesting as well to see how that goes. So um, in the Netherlands, I, I had my web design agency. Um, and I just dealt with my own clients. And now when I just got full time here, I started to read, okay, I need to get this paperwork right. And then I can go full time as well. <clears throat> and that's what I do now. So I work still with my clients in the Netherlands. And uh, as well, I do white level work uh, for agencies. So I do web design and I do branding as well, both. So at the moment. <clears throat> Beautiful. Yeah. So let's dive into it, man. I, again, I consider you one of the prime examples of how to white label with different companies from all over the globe. I mean, you're working with, with Eric and I within transit, you know, we're based in the U S but you've got a lot of clients in the U S that you do white label for mm -hmm. and elsewhere. I, I know you, like you said, you're still working with folks from Europe and all over. So I would love <clears throat> to find out where were you when you really decided to take the business serious and that you wanted to go full time with it? Cause I know you were working full time when you had come through my business course and that's how we got connected initially. And I, I want to talk about going full time. Maybe we'll save that here uh, to hear about how you got white labeling going, but yeah. What, what would it, what did it look like when you were working, but then you were doing white label and you, and you thought, you know what, I might want to take this full time and I want to start white labeling. What did that look like? And how did you go about that? Um, I think, well, initially I had my company next to my university studies. So I started doing that just on the side. Um, and I was working and back in the days, I think that was about seven, six, six years ago, um, that I was working at a company that I did some marketing communication for, and it had to maintain a few of their sites. And that's kind of how I got to know a little bit about WordPress and got in touch for the first time. <clears throat> and uh, then people started to ask me, okay, what can you do? Can you help me with that as well? So I said, yeah, just go for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had no clue how to set up a subdomain or a domain in general, how to install WordPress and things. You know and what, man? That's everybody's <clears throat> web design story is we all just fumble into it and we just keep on messing up and figuring stuff out. And the next thing you know, we've got a freelance web design business out of it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, from that, that day on, I just... In some way, through my personal network, I got my first clients, and some of them are still on the maintenance plan that I do. Beautiful. Um, 
and just just to still 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 the same price so it's about time to raise some prices there <laughs> as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and some have been the same for five six years as well so but um in that way i just started to during university uh, during during like three four years i just did that on on just on a casual basis i didn't have a lot of costs and when i went for like five months to peru or I lived here for my final internship here in Brazil. I lived, to, uh, lived here in Brazil. And during those times, I still maintained my company. I did a few projects here and there. Um, and this is what I always loved. And my father, he um, he has his own business, family company. Mm-hmm. And I've worked for that in the past, the summers and <laughs> as a kid, go with him to clients. So in that way, it was always in me to really be independent and gotcha. to, so you, you had a little entrepreneurial blood in you <laughs> from the get-go right just a little <laughs> just a little just uh just enough but uh and that's why i see really similarities as well so because my father he got me into some of the decisions in the company as well so what do you think of this can you go with me go, go go with me to certain meetings with an external company that does a marketing or a website and you get involved in that and you just get a vibe of how it is to really define your own day and to take your own decisions in what you do. And I think that's what is all has always been in there in, okay, I can't really work for someone else that just says, okay, do this and do that because I'm used to thinking about how to get things better, how to improve things. And my major in university is about more, uh, international business and languages. So that has international marketing in it, uh, international uh, sales and things related. <clears throat> so you have already a marketing and strategical background in things. So if you combine that with liking to build websites and going deeper with that, you have a nice package of things that you have to offer and then working for uh, a day, in a day job and having just to follow what the CEO says and just do this, do that, that really made me kind of a prisoner in that way. So Gotcha. So your, <laughs> your background, you're, you're already, you got some entrepreneur blood in you. You knew, I mean, it sounds like you didn't know for sure if you were going to own your business one day, but I'm sure it didn't catch you by surprise and it probably helped you. <clears throat> we'll talk about the, you know, going full time here, but the question is, you know, we, we talked about kind of your background and what led you to get to that point. But the question is, well, how do you do that? How do you go full time? You're where you are in the world. I don't know how many local clients could support a, a business that you would need to support your family in web design. So I know for you, white labeling was the key to, to really be able to go full time successfully. So how did you build and how did you start white labeling? And then maybe we'll talk about that transition of going full time with it. But how did you start? Yeah, um, I think in my case, where it started is that I think along the road, the, uh, the last six years, I think I've done some ca- uh, casual white labeling um, because I got to know more about Divi, got into the communities, and there was some, so always someone asking, okay, except for the non the regular questions in the group that I try to help uh, answer and resolve, there was always a regular uh, irregular person there that asked, okay, but I need something else on this project for a client as well. Can you help me with that? And I think during those moments, I already started to do a little bit of white label work. And I kind of liked that because that was just to the point, this is this is what needs to be done and just execute it. And you don't have to deal with the other things around getting clients. You just do what you're hired to do. And, <clears throat> and real when, quick on that, Christian, yeah. did you, how did you come across that? Because I see a lot of people on Facebook group that will just say, hire me or, you know, here's <clears> my <throat> website, but you came across with, with the right mentality. You helped first, but then when those offers were put out there, how did you go about it? Did you just put your website on the post and they recognize your face because you've already been helpful or how did that go about practically? Cause I know that's a big question that a lot of people have. Yeah. And I always encourage, you know, I, I encourage a lot of people, you don't want to just spam those groups and say, hire me, hire me. You have to be helpful first. But yeah, how did you go about actually getting some of those little one-off projects? Yeah. So my, general idea is is you need to give first 
before you receive in that way. And for the people that know me, at least know me my name, or maybe they have seen me in Facebook groups, and especially the Divi Web Designers group um, that is yours that you created, I think about four or five years ago now. Yeah, 16. It was fall of 16. So, yeah. yeah so that years. was just right after I got into Divi as well. And so I got in those, into those groups and and I've always been this way. I see a problem, I need to solve it. Yeah. <laughs> and I just, whenever I was online, I just got distracted sometimes as well by just going into the Facebook groups. And because I had, I had just my, uh, my normal job that I had, at the time initially during my studies, I just didn't need any benefit of receiving money in change for helping people. So mm -hmm. uh, I've never had really with that financial issues. So I was also able to give. So I just tried to help people fix things because I have my own people that help me fix things when I don't know things. And I think it's, it's the fair way that if you get help, it's a fair way to help others as well. Yeah. And I think uh, over the years, uh, people have seen me just quite a lot of times in the groups, have seen my name. And then if you help someone else into in a threat, and then either someone else sees that, okay, but uh, I need something made, uh, larger that would take some more time. Uh, would you be able to take on a project or do this for me? So they, then they generally reach out or it's the, po the, the, the one that posted the threat and I help them. And then they ask me, okay, I got on this other project, the thing. Yeah. And I think that's the key just to give without needing someone, something in return. And people see that, that you're not there just to get or like um, to get money from them because majority starts out just like me where you don't have really money to invest to hire someone and you just need someone to get something fixed really yeah. the, the smaller things well <laughs> and i just it's funny listening to you with your with your approach to the groups because it was the, the exact same that i thing that i did i mean my whole brand here started with me just answering questions in Divi Facebook groups. And that led me to create tutorials. And then when I started answering more questions, people just like you, Christian, started to know my name. And then I was getting offers left and right to work on Divi sites. And that's what exactly what happened with you is a helpful mentality first. You gave and you gave and gave and those opportunities came and you were, you know, if somebody's on a post asking for work and they see, you know, 10 people respond to say hire me, but then they see this Christian guy who is like, I'd love to help you out. It's a different type of approach than just say hire me and they know you. That's it. That's how it starts. But the trick is here. Those are just one off projects and it's really hard to build a business with one off projects because it's inconsistent. It's um, you're, you're limited to your time in a lot of ways. So how did you turn that into a business and how did you find white label partners? Did any of those uh, lead into white label partners? Was it any specific groups? What did that look like when you kind of took it to the next level? Yeah. Um, I think that started, I don't uh, I think with Stephanie Hudson, I think that we that she started first to say, okay, uh, Chris, are you available? I've got a few projects, and I've been in her from right to start. That we created the focus on your biz group, uh, the Facebook group, uh, and uh, I think from there we started to have a little bit more contact. We started to chat a bit, yeah. And uh, from one day she's asked me, okay, can you help me? on this project here. I need to get a few things done. And that continued that to on a regular basis, she had a few or like a, a small build for a, pro, for a client project, or she had a few features she needed to include in the site, or she needed to have some more custom coding or some adjustments in HTML, CSS, or including some jQuery. And on a regular basis, she started to get in touch. And we communicate a lot via Slack with that, and this was initially just for her company, Sweet Tea. <clears throat> mm. And she has her own company as well with Focus WP um, together with Tom. So, and because I was working that much with Stephanie, um, I think that's about a year and a half ago, a little bit more, maybe two years <clears throat> now. And Tom also asked me, well, can you 
I have a few things that I need some help with. So he asked me through Slack to the same channel I was using with Stephanie. He asked me if I could help him out on a few things as well. And I think that was a, a little bit of a start with that, just yeah. to not to grow it. But there was just a start of, okay, this, this is a nice way, getting first in touch with really more consistent work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that through the folks on Ubis group, it was Eric that asked if there was someone that could help him with a small graphic that he had. And since I do branding as well, and in the back of the days, I did some more print design and on an irregular basis still do uh, do that. Um, but he asked me, okay, can you help me with this logo? I need to have it um, saved as an SVG. I don't have it or need some adjustments. Mm. And I did that. And he asked me, oh, what do you want to pay me? I said, no, it's all good. It was just, just a five minute quick job. And he said, okay, but would you be available to do something else, a larger thing or some, some web design? And so that's how we started chatting. And we jumped on a call. Um, and he said, okay, I got a few projects here and need some help, just get started. <clears throat> and from that, I think at the moment, he is my second largest client. And together with Chris Selfaggio, who yeah. is in the, your uh, courses as well and in the club. Um, and those two at the moment are my major clients in terms of white label. So. I think that was my step from one or two clients to one that would become larger. <clears throat> yeah. Well, and that, what's really cool about that, Christian, is you mentioned the the group that Stephanie started focus on your biz. And I remember being on Divi chat with her that one time where she came up with the idea to, yeah, to make a Facebook exactly. group because her brand is focused WP with, like you mentioned, her and Tom. And of course, Stephanie's been on the podcast a couple of times. And I remember when she started that group. But and here's the difference. And the reason I'm pointing this out. My group, the Divi Web Designers group, is mainly a support group. So you're getting a lot of designers and a lot of DIYers in there trying to figure stuff out. It's not necessarily business owners. Whereas exactly. focus on your biz says it all. It's people who are focusing on their <clears throat> business. So that's a little trick too, just a little secret, a little top secret for everybody who's doing white label. If you really want to get in with people who are going to be consistent business owners for white labeling, you really need to put yourself in a position to be in a group where it's more business minded. But exactly. again, you didn't just get in there and start spamming all over the place. You were still very helpful and you did some stuff for free. So you did some work with Stephanie. You did some work with my now CEO, Eric, who runs in transit. Those were the two big ones. And then I think at a whole nother level, you joined my business course. And, and I remember, man, I remember you saying, I think it was in focus your biz because I just launched my business course. And I remember you saying, man, it's a really big investment for me with the currency. And I think I messaged you and said, I will do everything I can to, to make sure you get everything out of this investment or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you joined and you went through it. And then I saw what you did with your business. And then we have a Facebook group for the business course, which... I think a lot of people underestimate when you join a course, and I'm not just talking about my courses, but a number of different courses, you're often automatically included in the community. And I found yeah. this with my podcast because I, I joined a podcasting course and then that course has a Facebook group. And I've had a couple guests on this podcast already who have come from that group. So you're automatically in there. And that's, you just mentioned, uh, Chris, who you met, I think you guys started in the, the business group, right? I think Chris had some questions and you got connected with him. No, in this case, I think you referred a few names to him. That's of potential. right. That's right. Right. Uh, people that could help him get some websites done and to see if there's a fit. Um, That's right. You're right. Cause he, he asked me, Chris asked me, do you know any designers that might be a good fit for this? And I going back to you being consistent in the groups, man, I remember I was like, well, Christian's doing white label now and he's not full time yet, but he might be a really good fit. And I know he's really good at CSS. I know he's good at some of this other stuff. And then there you go. It was a perfect match. So, but I <laughs> wouldn't have felt comfortable referring you if I didn't already see how helpful you were. That was the biggie. Yeah. And I think that was yeah, that was the way as well because then we I jumped straight on on the chat with him and I, I had this email I was like okay who's this and um, then we just had a we jumped on a Zoom straight and I just shared what I think and what I've done because I already knew how some agencies or things work and I think for this part as well one of the keys was is that 
he is using the process that you have laid out in your web design process course and the, mm -hmm. the business course as well. And that makes it easier to connect with people in that same um, space because yeah. they use the same methodology and it makes it easier to integrate in those agencies because they say, okay, here's the project. And I, okay, I just follow the steps. <laughs> That's I, true. They, I didn't think about that. But for <laughs> you, you're working with Eric and Chris who have both been through my courses and they have my, my process is their process now. So that's got to be pretty cool for you. You don't have to worry about different processes. And I mean, I'm sure there's some things that are a little bit different, but overall, like yeah. you said, the method methodology is there. Yeah. But going back at how to, how to get those uh, agencies, how to work with those partners. I think the focus on your biz is really good for me. So as you said, the Divi web designers group isn't necessarily a group of web design uh, agency owners. Um, there's a, they are a lot, but it's a large group. I think about 45 K plus members or even more right now. Um, <clears throat> but I think that helps to, because what you're doing, you're, uh, niching or niching or yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah. everyone calls tomato, it. <laughs> tomato, tomato, yeah. Niche, and, whatever uh, you want to call it. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's what you need to do in how to get clients. So that's basically just marketing. That's just yeah. how to, what is your ideal client for that service? So in this case, white label work is what you do for someone that is either a freelance web designer with a lot of projects or it's someone that calls himself an agency. A lot of times it's the same same name, <laughs> yeah. but you just position yourself in a market differently towards uh, your customers. Now, but, <clears throat> did you have your website up at that point and did you have mention of white labeling or was it very organic with how you went about that? Well, for me, it's all just inside the Facebook groups. I never, because my website is just like any other <laughs> agency or like freelance web designer, we forget about ours. And I've always been so busy. And, and since I was getting so many things out of the Facebook groups and as well through the white label agencies, I never really needed to focus on my own marketing as well. And majority of my own clients that I have in the Netherlands, for example, are true. Uh, referrals yeah, so yeah. and just and i'm actually really ashamed of my own side and there's people that say okay <laughs> i just like it it's still good and things um but i've already gotten a new logo uh which i got here up in the on in the room as well probably saw yeah, it before saw we it good. started recording <laughs> um but one of the things that was there is that I just didn't care about doing my own site. And it's yeah. about just like the car mechanic that works on cars any day in his own car. It's just. Yeah. Well, and that's that's yeah. the beauty, though. Like, to be honest, I mean, I wouldn't advise that you have a site you're not proud of as a white labeler, but you didn't need it. Like you were you found, you know, you you were helpful and you built your network enough to where you had some really good referral partners with white label agencies. Mm -hmm. And then you gave all of your attention to them. And that's the same motto I've been saying for a long time is you don't have to kill yourself marketing and getting new clients. If you focus on your best clients and for you, those yeah. were Eric and Chris and the white label folks. So I love that, man. That's great. And I know yeah. you're, you know, you're taking a lot of strides and on the business side of things, you've really opened up your mindset. And I want to talk about going full time because mm -hmm. you start so you got consistent white label stuff and then you came to a crossroads and I remember you messaged me about this because, uh, and I still, I love, I had the post in the, in the Facebook group, our, our course Facebook group mm -hmm. where you are saying you're planning on going full time. And I'd love to talk about what went through your head there because you were making, I think if I remember right, I think you were making about half what you made in your full time job you know, why are you a white labeling? But, and then you kind of figured like I did when I went full time, if I go full time, I can probably, you know, exceed my income tenfold. So, um, talk about going full time with it. Did you feel like there was enough white label work that you could really grow it? Uh, I know you don't have a family. I mean, you're married, but you don't have kids yet. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you're in a place in the world where you don't need to, it's not a high, uh, standard of living as far as your mm -hmm. currency and stuff. So did that all factor in to help <clears throat> you go full time and take that jump? Well, initially, I didn't think about going full time just to do white level work. And that was, and I always had, so as I said, I had really the urge as well. I always had 
to have my own business and just work for myself and to make money for myself and not make money for someone else. And when I first got to Brazil, um, I did my graduation internship because in the Netherlands we do like a graduation internship is that you go to a company and that's where you write your thesis or your dissertation. You write it inside the company while kind of working there. So in general, it's like 10% you're working there and 90% work on your dissertation. And that company uh, is where I worked as well when we got married and I got into that company. <clears throat> and um, and in order to, for me as well to, uh, after getting married, I really, as I said, okay, I don't have a lot of income from my web design part. I got sufficient to at least um, with a normal um, salary, at least here, local salary here, yeah. uh, with my uh, side hassle as complementary uh, income, yeah. I would have been at least a little bit more freedom here to do to do things and to really sustain my, my, my family. But without my day job, I wouldn't have stable income. And I thought, especially when getting married, getting to a new co country, and you need to get all the things in the house, you need to really establish your, the things. Because if I would have lived in the Netherlands, got a married there, I probably would have, there's all, every family member has, okay, here's, here's a fridge, here is this, oh, and here's sure, that. Yeah. And when you're living overseas, that's harder. And that makes it harder for, for to get your, get starting. And, and it's, and it's sad as well, because one of the things to work here in Brazil or to have a company, you need to have uh, your permanent visa or a working visa and a working visa would take too much time to get done. And we were getting married anyway. So I was waiting to get married, get our documentation, right. Get my visa and then get my kind of my work passport because okay. what they have, we generally use just a, uh, a, a CV, right. A resume. And we just send it to another company when you want to work there but here in Brazil, they have next to that, they have this little kind of a passport, which they call it. Uh, which I call it, but it's their work card, which includes all your previous um, em um, employers or employees where you've worked before with your rent, with your salary, the dates and things. And I needed that before getting to work as well. So, so, so you basically, <clears throat> you're saying you, you got everything set up to, you know, in place for you and your wife, before transitioning <clears throat> full time, right? Like you, while you were working full time, you made sure that your house was in order, everything was in place, and that gave you a little more flexibility and leeway to go full time. Is that right? Yeah. So, but um, I knew, I didn't think about yet going full time. I was just keeping it on the side, but I, because I wanted I needed to have the extra income, and uh, for I, I started to work as a marketing coordinator at the company. I didn't make. Uh, the salary I could make as an international um, resident here because then you can get into larger companies that have better salaries. And because I speak multiple languages, uh, you're better in a better place. But what yeah. I wanted is to just get to the company, learn first what I need to know about local culture in terms of business and yeah, stuff. Yeah, gotcha. And it's an accounting firm. So it helps me as well to know how things in terms of businesses go. How is the part of the legal part and things behind that? And after a few months in as well, I just felt, okay, I'm not made to work for someone else, to work in a company where someone else says if my work is okay or not, because I knew it was, yeah, and it was yeah. great. And that was kind of how I, well, I was thinking about, okay, how can I prepare myself to go full-time? Because I was about to lose my fixed income because that would guarantee at least because in my opinion when you get married you need to take care of the family and to take care of the house my wife she had a day job as well but at least my part i feel maybe it's a manly thing as well we feel kind of had the urge we need to take care oh, sure. of that and it's our responsibility partially it's not completely that we take that upon us <laughs> maybe mentally uh, and that's why i chose for my day job 
but in there i was just like yeah <laughs> it's not yeah. completely what i want and i had questions about people can you take on this project i was like no i can't because i just don't have the time to do it and to really invest in my marriage because the first two years of marriage are really important in the way how you connect how, especially in different cultures yeah. And I think, so you, you didn't yeah. rush full, going full time because you oh. knew it would be too much at that point, which is great. I like, never this is rush. A, this is a great lesson in you don't have to, to rush if you don't need to. Like you, you played the long game with building your brand with the Facebook groups and getting yourself to a place where you could go full time, <laughs> focusing on your marriage, focusing on your house and everything. But then it came. It still came. You got to that point where you're like, OK, I want to go full time. And the kicker that I'm excited to hear more about is you went full time right when COVID hit. I remember yeah. <laughs> you, so you went full-time in March, 2020. And cause I remember your post in our group saying you just went full-time. And then the week after we in Columbus, Ohio shut down. So, was, so I was like, man, like I, I didn't say this out loud, but I was like, Oh my God, I feel so bad that Christian went full-time right when it, right when it just, you know, shit hit the fan. But the cool thing is, is you've come through with flying colors and 2020 was an amazing year for you. So let's talk about that. You, you decided to leave the job, take the risk. And you mentioned, you know, you had thought about building the business. White label wasn't on your radar as, as you as thought much. it was going to be as, as much. <laughs> yeah. So did you find that you just, when you went full time, that you had more time to devote to that? And that's just what the best opportunity was, or what did that look like when you finally made the jump? Yeah. So I think it was already in the in November uh, before or even before that, because I think I took the course 2018, maybe because I think or 2019. Uh, 2019, I yeah, because I, I, I launched it in the fall of 2019, early fall. So yeah. I think, yeah, you took it. Then, and I remember you said that your goal was to go full time, I think, in the spring of 2020. Yeah. So, so you again, you gave yourself some time. You didn't rush it. You didn't make any bad decisions. You, you kind of put all your ducks in a row and, and led up to that. Yeah. And I'm really, with everything I do, I'm really structured or try to be structured. And I always overthink things too much as well. And um, yeah, so I was already in the, in the, the phase of rebranding, redoing my logo because, okay, I'm going to a new country, going to redo a few things. So I need to have a branding that makes sense internationally as well without a tagline and without all the, the things around it. <clears throat> and in November, so I think I pre-ordered the course and I said, okay, I'm going, f I'm going to work towards going full-time in, um, in the spring, uh, or at least in 2020, 2020. And when I say, say that, I just do it as well. I don't yeah. <laughs> get anything in the way. And so as soon as the year, advanced so 2020 and 2019 came to its end almost i already talked to my boss and i was like okay i'm looking for a way to get out mm. uh, what is the way because i didn't know exactly how to how to um to resign in an inter in another country how does that work <laughs> because it was totally new so i said yeah. okay what is the, is there a specific time that you still need to work? Is there uh, anything about that? So how does that work? And when would be fitting for you as well? Oh, and so you, you didn't <clears throat> just give your two weeks and, and peace out. You, you played the long game with that too, kind of give them some heads up. I'm sure that, you yeah. know, that's gotta, that's gotta be respected <clears throat> by, by your boss. If he knows what's coming without being shocked, if you just, you know, don't show yeah. up one day. <clears throat> I think as well for me, it's a bit, a little bit about ethics as well. And I think yeah. my, by, so the company I work at, my boss was the, the, the CEO, the, the MO, CMO of the company. So he was the marketing like business development guy in the company. And he is also my best man. So we had oh. really a close connection. <laughs> Dang, well, okay. Yeah. That, made it, that makes it 10 yeah. times more complex here. I didn't realize it was like a personal friend. Yeah, but, um, but it doesn't make it more complex. We just make it ourselves sometimes too complex. Mm, okay, and I think good. if you have a really good friendship that you call can call, some, call someone your best man on your wedding, I think you can talk about things that go outside of work as well and just have a normal chat about things. And we had just an open-hearted conversation during lunch probably. Um, and I said, okay, I'm just looking towards going for myself, working to work for myself. And we just 
get over to the, he just sent an informal note to HR to ask what are the procedures and how to do things. And mm. he just reported back to me and said, okay, this and this is the way. So, and I said, okay, what will be a great moment for you? Uh, he said, never, but <laughs> right, right. he said, never, yeah. but I said, okay, but if that would be. So we decided on just get 21, 2020 started and then I'm going uh, going out of the company. Gotcha. So, um, starting from March 15, I was leaving the company. And when I when after my last day, you need to get back to the company to uh, get that passport for them to uh, sign it and uh, to say, okay, you left the company this and this day. That was the week after. And that day that I went there was the day they started to put to put. Uh, alcohol and masks in the co- in the in the oh, in the company yeah so uh, that was the first day really it hit and we really didn't know about <laughs> that it was going to happen. So here. literally <laughs> like the day you went full time with your web design stuff, that's when, yeah. you know, all the, co- the COVID <clears throat> stuff really came to, came into play. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So and, did you just buckle yeah. down at that point? And how did, how did white label, when did you know that white label was the best option for you? Because I, I know you're, what's interesting about you, Christian is you're a hell of a designer, a coder, but you have a very savvy business mind as well. And that's a very powerful combo. Most people are either really savvy with <coughs> business and don't want to touch websites or they're really good with design and, and dev. And they just, maybe they don't want to do the business end of things, but you seem to be a little mix of both. So yeah. When did you, when did you realize, okay, you know what white labeling is, is actually the best step for me? Because that well, I know that was the majority of your income in 2020. Yeah. At the moment, if I look at it, it was 70% of my income. Mm. And that's including uh, including my day job. <laughs> yeah. So 60, 70% was that. <clears throat> so um, I think when I was so when, going... So when you th- went full-time real quick, because you were in your day job a few months, and then for <clears throat> 2020, 70% was white label. So it's probably safe to say... Upon going full time, it was almost all of your income. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, and I think I started to work with Eric December, the first thing. And starting in January, February, we started to work on the first projects. <clears throat> and a few of those just got stuck because of COVID, that it didn't mm-hmm. continue. Um, but at least I knew Eric always said, okay, I'm growing my business and I need you. So I knew, okay, whatever happens, at least I have with Eric some more consistent projects coming in. Yeah. And I, at that time, it was well, I read already as well, Profit First, and I got in February, my business set up here in Brazil, and starting from March, I was able to get a business account as well. Beautiful. Um, so from that day on, I really started to do things as a company as well. <clears throat> and I said to my clients, my white label guys, I said, okay, and at that time, Chris wasn't in the picture yet. And I think that was in Mar, April, maybe Mar, May, that you said, okay, here's Chris and get oh, started. That's right. so, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you had just gone full so, time. Yeah, that's so right. that helped me as well. And I think as well, because when you have guys with agencies like Stephanie, she has always has contacts where people know each other and people know Eric. And you started to get to know a little bit about that Eric was growing. I was working with him on white label work. You started to refer some people. And in that way, I was able to say as well to those people, okay, I'm ready to grow. If you need to, I'm here to get your projects on uh, as soon as possible. And I think that was really what helped in that way. And uh, through Facebook groups and chats, some other agencies started, okay, Chris, uh, I need, need to do some project here. Can you help yeah. me? And I generally have, agencies generally have positive uh, experience with me. Uh, I might be not the cheapest on the market if you go to the Facebook groups, but I'm definitely not the most expensive one in terms of hourly rates if you compare it how agencies uh, position themselves with hourly rates. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all about the value. You're worth every, yeah, you're worth every penny, which, you know, you're working with me. So, you know, I'm going to be encouraging you to raise your rates here. So I don't know uh, how, how Eric's going to feel about that, but Hey, we're all, we're all in this together. Now I want to know, 
when you went full time, did you ever have like a panic moment or did you have any sort of point where you're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because when you're more business minded as well, you're kind of a control freak with those things as well. Yeah. We, we love, I was even getting nice documents to have all my uh, processes as SOPs documented. I think I've even sent you a few screenshots shots of those back in the days. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe. you were going through my course <laughs> and then you showed me your uh, client list, your A, your master, you know, your A clients, your B clients, your C's mm-hmm. and how you have everything <laughs> organized. Yeah. Yeah. So, and if you're like that, that way, having no consistent income guaranteed <laughs> as far as a thing that can freak us out every day. And I said to my wife, okay, if I'm just going to have a normal revenue per month of double my um, uh, wage, uh, what I, my salary that I had here, because I take out in the back of the day 60% for my own part because of profit first. Mm-hmm. So I divide it all into nice boxes and things. And I said, okay, to have at least my general income, I need to make this. So, and I was able able to hit that because of the currencies as well. Because of COVID, currencies for me went to skyrocket as well. Oh, yeah. Because the dollar went up, which guaranteed more local currency for me. Oh, so so interesting. It was actually, in a weird way, (laughs) it was actually a benefit for you because of the currency change. Yeah. Yeah. So, in order to get for myself get plugins in dollars and things that was harder as well because for me yeah, th- those prices yeah. went up so courses and things they were just up and and that was uh, for me for uh was for pounds it was for australian dollar canadian uh us dollar everything went up in the same way and my local currency went, went down so i made more money without raising my rates yeah and yeah. that was a huge benefit as well that made it so for this year my folks as well to okay i need to up my work or my rates because i know if covid is going to settle down i expect at least to have those get together a little bit more balanced that's not a good how mindset. it was before yeah. but <clears throat> yeah so i was always freaking out but i'm not going to pay the bills in the end of the month what is the and they said okay what is the worst thing that can happen to me because my wife she had a f- fixed income yeah we talked about this <clears throat> i remember and you know you know yeah. man like that's my that's my big thing when it comes to risk is what is the worst thing that could possibly happen and, and <clears throat> be okay with it and so like, for, for you like you were never going to end up on the street right i mean you would have figured something out worst case scenario yeah and I can always go get into Facebook groups and say and get some work. And that's just how it is. If you have a name, people know you're capable of doing things. Uh, you can write someone if needed and say, okay, do you have a project for me? If it's someone you've worked with before, if it's an agency that you know, there's always they always need a few things done or more the basic things. So you say, okay, if I lower a little bit my rate, would you be able to give me some work in that? And my experience is white label agencies or agencies who work with pay way faster than normal companies. <clears throat> oh, sure. Yeah. And I think the general uh, payment due date that, or that payments come in and use a payment processor online, even so that takes a bit as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's in three days, majority of bills of my white label clients are paid. Well, with normal customers, it can be seven, 14, 30 days before things are paid. So that was a good thing as well. Yeah. <clears throat> now your income took off pretty quick. I remember how, <clears throat> how soon was it that you started making what you made full time and realized, oh my gosh, I can make a lot more now because I'm not limited. I'm finally not limited by selling. Yeah, so it was that quick, right? Yeah, because uh, because especially when we take on projects, we take on 50% deposits. And that's what I do with white level work as well. And when I was growing as well, and while Eric, for example, was growing, we started to revise a little bit about how we do projects. And he was starting to do a lot of projects on his own, but I did more initial designs. So we just uh, set almost a fixed rate for this type of site. The initial design would be this, and this type of site, it would be this. And initial rate, initial deposits, they hit immediately. So for mm. us, the good thing is, at least if we close that month, the project, 
or two or three or four projects, we at least have some income that month. Yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah. Right. The right. question is, the only thing is, and that's what I see, is that if I look at my revenue over the last year, I see there's a few bumps mm -hmm. and a few, there's just a few lows, like two lows. I think that was August and it was December. And October was a really high one. So yeah. that was 50%. That's so funny, man. Average. That's exactly yeah. like, I swear <clears> that <throat> is the pattern of most web design is August. Can, can, like late summer generally tends to be a little <laughs> slower because people are vacationing or they're getting back from trips in a busy <laughs> summer. And then they start to focus in the early fall, which means usually September and October is big. And then December typically has always been the lowest month for most web design in my, my experience because of holidays. And a lot of people don't want to start a project right before they're getting ready to go into the holidays and they're already spending money for, for gifts and stuff. So generally they wait till like January to get going. So that's so funny because I've seen yeah. this exact Although same thing. I expected thing, December to be more balanced, more my average because mm. Even though you have that, a lot of larger companies, because if you start to work with some larger agencies who work with less the local businesses, and you work with more companies that have a marketing budget and where the marketing department says, okay, I still got budget to pay you this year. That's true. Yeah. There are some so, people who want to get that off the books. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but it was good. And uh, I started to, and one of the things I implemented as well, because of pro profit first, I was able to save money. And that's why over the last few months, I was able to get some more things, get some more things. And uh, every quarter I was able to, okay, say, okay, I need to have this, this much in the bank of the company. And what's left on top of that, I just pay myself yeah. as a bonus. Well, and that's what's so great about once you get to the point where you can give yourself a buffer is those low months aren't going to stress you out or kill you because you already have that buffer in place and you know the exactly. month after that is likely going to be much better. Now, um, obviously, the, the big fix to all that is recurring income, which I know it's a little more difficult to build recurring income with white label, but you're also still balancing some of your clients. And I know you're, you're very business savvy, so I know like the next couple of years are going to look very different because... I know you're focusing on all kinds of different avenues for more recurring income, but, but I love to hear how white labeling came through for you, man. Like that, what a cool success story that almost instantaneously, instantaneously, excuse me, you were making more than your full-time job, but you don't have to tell me exact numbers, but what I know recently was, didn't you say you made like, was it five times more than yeah, or about like five that? times at the moment? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, five times more doing white labeling primarily than you were at your court at your day job at a salary yeah. job. Yeah, and that, at that moment, my wife's like, "Okay, you should have done this first. <laughs> <Before. laughs> yeah. yeah, you should have done that before." <laughs> <clears throat> but I said yeah. to her as well because I was really close, working closely with the CMO, and he's a guy that has been in business for a long time. And being on his side is what learning from him was for me so invaluable because you can study whatever on uni or whatever thing you do. Like you can take your business course, but if you don't put it into practice or get yes. back to lessons, you won't get it yeah. because you have yeah. no way to implement it. And that was for me, my key thing of being in a company, even though it was a low pay uh, compared to what I could do, um, but it was sufficient to pay the bills. And that allowed me to learn a lot in the pra practically. So, and that was really beneficial for that. And when I started to, to go to uh, really into white label, it's like, mm, am I going to do this? Because I can't have recurring income with white label work. You can have recurring projects. Yeah. But it depends yeah. on when your client, white level clients get projects and if they use you to execute them, but you won't have. So sometimes in, and then when I talk about a new company I'm starting to work with and I said, this is my rate or my percentage for projects. And I said, well, maybe it might be that you, before you had 100% of the project was yours, but now you're making, you're paying someone to do it. And I said, well, you are able to do twice as much projects at the same time. Right, right. But I won't have recurring income. And you will have that client forever, at least 
you will have those on a recurring plan. And if you do that right, you might able even just be a recurring income company without building the sites yourself and completely exactly. doing everything yeah. external. And as long as you are in a place, because for example, uh, in the Netherlands, I really have a hard time raising rates on maintenance plans. Even though you explain value, you explain we're, we're able to include this and this and this in the maintenance plan. They just, oh, but if I can click on the button myself to update a site, why <laughs> should I pay you this much for, for, for doing oh, that? Oh, well, they'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then they say, okay, and then I prefer to pay you an hour to fix it. And because they don't want to have the fixed cost that much. <clears throat> and that was making it sometimes harder as well. So, and I said, okay, white label work is perfect for me at the yeah. moment. Yeah, and I don't right. know for how much time I'm going to do that. And I hope to build my own company on the side. I just hired a new guy. Um, it's, it's from from the family of my wife. She's um, it's my cousin. Uh, it's the, And he is just, we, because when I lived, and for the first time in Brazil, like oh, uh, when I really started to date my wife and I started to live with them, um, I started to know him a little bit. It was 14 at the time or 13. Mm. He's now 16 and he's really into more tech things. And I said, okay, what do you want to do? What are you going to work on? And I said, okay, I'm here, I'm, I'm here to help you. And I want, and I have things to teach you and bit by bit, I'll make you capable to help me with my business mm. on either maintaining my own clients, either do some graphic stuff or even help on white level projects in time. Yeah. And mm. yeah, that's sometimes hard because if you uh, set your side yourself a high standard of working, it's sometimes hard to, to scale because I can only take as much projects as much. And you say, okay, you can take on, 10, five, 10 projects, you just need to stagger them, give them the, the, no, the no update on Friday and things. Yeah. You just need to keep the client happy, show them that you're working on things. But white level work is different with that. Mm -hmm. Because you are saying, we will say that to the one that needs to say that to his client. Yeah, and that that's a good makes point. another level of that. That makes it harder to have many projects at the same time. Yeah. So, well, the beauty is, you, is you're, as you get more valuable too, you can be more selective and you can just work with a couple people if you want or, um, yeah. you know, have a more like structured <clears throat> kind of schedule and flow. And, and they know you too. And they know what you can take on, what you maybe can't take on. And like you're, you're an interesting point because you're kind of scaling white labeling, which is really cool. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing is, is every agency works differently. And I work now, I have... Uh, seven to eight agencies on the list of agencies I worked with last year, maybe 10 even. And um, that's in the US, that's Canada, that's Australia, that's the Netherlands, that's the UK. Um, different agencies I work with in that way. And every agency has their own demands. So some are more full build, some are initial build, some are more the on-demand that thing. So for example, with Focus WP uh, last year, I had a lot of things that they just added tasks into Slack, into ClickUp, and I just mm. went in there in 24, 48 hours and get them done. <clears throat> and that would have me like an invoice to send on the first of each month because sure. of the billable hours. And yeah. a few agencies I work with that that way. And, um, <clears throat> but depending on the agency and the stages there are. So for example, Eric, he is really business minded. He is looking at scaling, uh, improving processes and things. And so my part is less in that part. I know I can, we always, we, we, we chat every now and then, we jump on the Zoom and hey, Chris, how would you do this? Mm -hmm. But in general, he is the one that goes into those. And it just, if I see in a project, that we are doing things different. I say, okay, we can change that in our routine. But so for example, with Chris, um, we're on a different level because he has less experience with web design. And so we're looking both how to merge my experience with his process and how to be able to make that scale and how can we make 
um, basic things. So what are the plugins we're using? So yeah. uh, Eric now if in transit, he's using more, for example, gravity forms. And I generally use Caldera. So when I start working with wide-level clients that don't have a preference, I tend to start working with Caldera because it's free mm-hmm. to not get into high costs from the start on if you don't have clients that pay for the licenses yet. Or you can include that as a part of the fee. And uh, in that way, you start to really help another agency form. And sometimes difficulties is that that they start to completely depend on you as well. So that makes it sometimes harder to scale up your business to yeah. take on other agencies because you need to have a certain level of dedication to some companies. <clears throat> And, yeah, uh, but that's it's, it's just been great, man. <laughs> I mean, you've really I know you're at a kind of a different point now because we're closing in at the at the time of releasing this, you'll have been um, full time for over a year. So it's pretty dang awesome, man, to see that you five X your income with primarily yeah. white label design and to yeah. see what you've done. And uh, I appreciate hearing the whole path from how you started and what your mindset was to just helping out in Facebook groups, to getting one off jobs, to doing white label, to going full time. And you're balancing yeah. your business with also doing white label. And kind of last thing I wanted to ask you, because we've been talking for an hour here, um, because uh, you kind of talked about how you manage different pro- projects and, and working with different mm-hmm. white label people. What would be your number one recommendation for others who want a white label, uh, particularly working with different companies? Is is would you say being flexible to what they use or or um, sharing what you know? What's like your biggest tip for somebody who wants to do white label? Um, I think my biggest tip is to put the other company first and understand who they are and what their processes are. And in my case, I put myself as flexible as possible, but it's always important to commun- communicate clearly with them and to say, okay, I'm working with you, but there's other agencies I work with as well. So sometimes I can't take on a project just because I want to offer the best quality for every project. Mm. And if it reaches a certain number of projects, I can't deliver that. And uh, for an agency depending on you or some have other options as well to white label to other guys, it's the best way to say, okay, I can't sometimes take on a project. Mm, yeah. And to be fair, because if you say, okay, get me the project, get me the details, get me the deposit, and we get started. And if you don't start in like three weeks, they have the final client mad (laughs) they start asking questions how can we do this can we and i think the best way of doing that is really to be honest to yourself and as well to the agency you're working with so they know what they can expect and if uh, an agency agency comes with you can i get offer you some irregular work and i say okay but i've got a few other agencies i work with as well that i want to guarantee the highest quality possible from my side and I can work at night at well, but then my quality won't be good. Mm, won't yeah. be as high standard as I want it to be. So for that, yeah, communication and be always clear from my side and towards your white level client in that way. <clears throat> yeah. What a great ending tip, man. That's a great mentality to have. I'm super proud of you, Christian, for what you've done, for going full time and for killing it. And uh, you're obviously one of my trusted go tos for uh, a lot of CSS and jQuery and all kinds of crazy stuff. So, man, it's you've been invaluable for for me too. Um, and man, it's been awesome to see your journey progress. And I know we're just at the start because 2021 is going to be a heck of a year for you, and you've got a lot yeah. of stuff uh, that's going to look a lot different over the next couple of years. And I'm really excited to see how it progresses progresses man cool yeah i think it's going to be a great year and one of my folks as well is that i think it wasn't the folks on your bis group that stephanie asked what is your focus word for 2021 and it's that efficiency mm-hmm. and when you have been working so long in the facebook groups giving free tips that's almost a daily routine and when you start really going full-time you need to, may need to make sure that your clients are happy in the time you deliver projects and my way is to in order to upscale um, and to help other agencies grow as well um, I need to be more efficient and get really majority of distractions away or focus on 
a real things that you need to focus on to be productive. So, and yeah. that's a balance that when you start to go into full-time, that's the thing that you need to learn because you don't do it anymore in your late, late, late yeah, nightly right. hours after having a day of work with all the stress and frustration and they get into a creative process of designing a project that's totally different than full-time. And yeah. 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 Well, great stuff, Christian, man. Super pumped for you. Thanks for coming on. It was awesome to chat and really excited to see what you do here in 2021, man. Hey, thank you. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Christian, talk to you, man. See ya. Hey guys and gals, just wanted to pop in with a couple things before you head out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. I would love to hear your feedback and it will also help other web designers find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to joshhall.co, click on podcasts and search this episode number and you'll find all the links, descriptions and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.